Yeah, because it's kind of a slow business. My screen still says I'm in a practice session. Is that is that bad? Yes, that's right. Uh, you're going to be out of a practice session in a moment because I'm going to press start webinar right now. Cool. Yeah, because it's kind of a slow business. My screen still says I'm in a practice session. Is that is that bad? Yes, that's right. Uh, you're going to be out of a practice session in a moment because I'm going to press start webinar right now. Cool. Yeah, because it's kind of a slow business. My screen still says I'm in a practice session. Um, Grace, something <laughs> strange is happening with our... We're in a, we're in a time loop. <laughs> start webinar right now. It is fantasy. <laughs> it's kind of a slow business. Science fiction. My screen still says I'm in a practice session. Grace, something strange is happening with our... We're in a time loop. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it was me. It was all me. I'm really sorry. Okay. Well, um, is I think uh, is this the are we are we now admitting um, everybody into the into the session? I think this might be the. Uh, Apparently this it was me. It. it was all me. I'm really sorry. Okay. okay. Well, um, is are you watching the YouTube as well? Some kind of feedback thing going on, isn't there? But. Hmm. Oh, people are here. Hello. We're having technical issues, surprisingly. Oh. Hi, Alison. So I think that might have resolved the problem. Uh, yes, uh, Dimitra's instructions tell me that I should, uh, I should have shut down the, 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 the other window, so I have. Welcome everybody. How lovely to see you. See you. I hope uh, I can see uh, I can some see some names coming up already. And uh, uh, thank you very much for letting us know where you are. That's one of the things that we re really enjoy at the beginning of these uh, Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic Sessions to find out where people are coming from. Clara says she's a dinosaur, um, but uh, this is slightly alarming. But oh, I think she's possibly referring to the uh, the background of one of our guests today, who is Fraser Dalahi. So today we're going to be uh, speaking about the infernal riddle of historical fantasy, and the reason that why we've given the session that name is that because we're going to be celebrating the, uh, the 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 publication of this novel here, the infernal riddle of Thomas Peach which is set in the late 18th century and is full of demonic goings on that I think we'll be talking about a little in the course of today. So uh, welcome to this session. And I'm going to begin by, uh, by introducing myself and my guests. So I'm gonna begin with myself. Uh, I'm the co-director of the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic at the University of Glasgow, along with my colleague, Dr. Demetra Femi. At the moment, I'm particularly interested in the writer-artist Mervyn Peake, and in my past life, I was a scholar of early modern English literature, so I'm particularly interested in historical fantasy. James Treadwell, who you also see in front of you, is the author of the Advent Trilogy, which is about the calamitous return of magic to a world that has forgotten it. Before becoming a full-time writer, he was an academic whose books include Interpreting Wagner, and autobiographical writing and British literature, 1783 to 1834. Today, we're dedicating ourselves, as I said, to thinking about uh, ideas and questions raised by his new novel, The Infernal Riddle of Thomas Peach. Also in front of you, you will see Liz McWhirter, who has joined us uh, as uh, the award-winning copywriter and author, uh, whose first novel, Black Snow Falling, was published by Scotland Street Press in 2018 and was nominated for the prestigious Car Carnegie Medal the following year. She's currently writing her next historical novel, which will be her debut for adults in the context of a creative practice PhD at the University of Glasgow. And last but not least, you're, you're always supposed to say that, aren't you, Fraser? Um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Fraser Dalahi, uh, who is a lecturer in the Historical Thesaurus of English at the University of Glasgow. 
He's deputy director of the Historical Thesaurus of English and is currently working with colleagues in Glasgow and at the Oxford English Dictionary to update the thesaurus to its second edition. And if you don't know anything about the thesaurus, I, I hope you will by the end of the session. So um, we're going to begin the event with a short reading from James's novel by James himself. So sit back, relax, grab a glass of something nice and, uh, and listen. It should be about 10 minutes. Um, just to contextualize the passage I'm going to read to you, um, uh, our, um, our hero, Thomas Peach, um, has uh, recently discovered at this point in the novel um, that uh, assassins have been spotted near his house and they're on his trail. Um, uh, his house is way out in a remote part of um, rural England. Um, and he uh, understands that these assassins have been sent to kill him. Um, so at very short notice and in a panic, he's devised a trick which involves conning another man uh, to come and sit in his house uh, wearing his clothes so that the assassins will kill this other man instead. Um, and in order to effect this trick, one of the things he's had to do is send everybody else away from the house, um, in particular his housemaid, uh, whose name is Clarissa Riddle, um, known familiarly as Clary, um, and who may or may not be the infernal riddle of the title. Uh, she almost certainly is. Um, so she's been sent off for the night um, and told not to come back till the next day. Um, and the trick is set up and it works. And the other man uh, wearing Mr. Peach's clothes uh, in his house is assassinated uh, while Mr. Peach is hiding upstairs in the dead of night. And uh, here is where our narrator picks up the story. For anybody who has got the novel, um, in this rather beautiful edition, um, and would like to follow along. We are on page 306, about three quarters of the way down. Where then is Mr. Peach? Why, he is behind the house and has set a lantern hanging from a branch by whose light he is digging a grave. Our narrative, we confess, has taken a Gothic turn do not think, reader, that we intend to linger over the horrid scenery of these nocturnal tableaux, the chair with its ghastly occupant, the man toiling at his morbid task, watched by the bat and the screech owl. We shall not labor to supply you with those sensations of delicious horror, which are meat and drink to a certain class of readers. Look more closely at Mr. Peach. Do you not see that there is very little of the romantic in the occupation of grave digging? Ask any fellow who has turned the earth and they will confirm it. It is toilsome, unforgiving work and no more thrilling a spectacle than the operas of the Frenchman Lully, which indeed require as great a length of time to achieve their purpose and are similarly well suited for laying a man to rest. We shall resume our narrative, therefore, at the moment when Mr. Peach's digging is interrupted. The cause which prompts him to lift the spade to his shoulder and recover his breath is the intrusion of a noise as perfectly unwelcome as it is unexpected, the sound of a rider in the road. We do not know the exact hour of the night, though beyond doubt it is that period of deep darkness when nobody ought to be abroad. In London, perhaps, or another substantial metropolis, we would not raise a brow at the passing of the watchman or a thief or two, or some miserable drab of the streets. We need hardly say, this is not London. Mr. Peach extinguishes the lantern. Reflect for but a moment on his present occupation and the condition of his parlour, and you will understand that he has no wish to attract the attention of any passerby. The horse continues to approach. Its gait is slow and even. It comes beside the house where it stops. We have not thus far in our chapter attempted to describe the state of mind of Mr. Thomas Peach at this interesting moment in his history. We are somewhat reluctant, for we confess, it does not look well in a man who has recently contrived the murder of a fellow creature and is at present digging for that same unfortunate, his final resting place, secret, unmarked and unhallowed. It does not, we say, look well in him that he is near giddy with pleasure and humming as he digs. If such be the case, we do not positively say it is the case, though put us to the question and we will not deny it. If so, let us at least allow him this much in way of mitigation, 
that he has within these past few hours escaped what had appeared to be certain death. In such a circumstance, might not the animal spirits rise by mere reflex from being sunk under the weight of mortal danger to an un uncommon height? We think they might. Be that as it may, Mr. Peach is now plucked down from this elevation by this wholly unantilip unanticipated crisis, excuse me. Confound it, thinks he, have I crossed over the rapids of a deep and mighty river and come safely to the far bank, only to be tripped by accident into some humble muddy ditch and drown there instead. It is among the curiosities of Thomas Peach that he grows somewhat extravagant in metaphor when called upon to apostrophize his fate in inward discourse and habit none would guess who observed only the moderate and rational outward demeanor which he presents to the world. But still waters run deep. We run into an hydrological confusion and must extract ourselves by proceeding in plain words. Mr. Peach is dismayed at the extraordinarily unlucky chance which seems to have brought a traveler to his house at this hour of all hours. He tightens his hold on the spade and conceals himself among the shadows at the side of the house where the foliage overhangs thickly. The horse is being led to his very stable. The traveler has said no word nor carries any light. Now, our first thought may be that anybody who goes about the country at such an hour and in such a fashion, and who approaches a man's house giving no notice of their arrival and disdaining the benefit of a lantern, must certainly have no good intentions. It would be quite natural to think that Mr. Peach makes this very inference and will prepare himself accordingly, perhaps by raising the head of the spade on guard. However, Mr. Peach has no common mind. This person, he thinks, approaches my house without light, but I do not perceive them to stumble or hesitate. Therefore, it is likely they are familiar with the place. And besides, I thought I knew the gait of the horse. A few more moments confirm his guess, revealing that the figure who approaches the broken door under the half-occluded starlight is none other than the maid Clary, though he does not know her in the very first instant, because her outward appearance has again undergone a surprising alteration. Briefly, the young woman is quite naked. Mr. Peach is sufficiently astonished. How many times have we recorded our hero's astonishment at the behavior of Miss Clarissa Riddle? that for several further moments, he is uncertain how to proceed, during which interval Clary enters the house by the broken door at the side. The spell is broken. Mr. Peach is immediately mindful of what she will discover within and goes to the door, where he calls out, my explicit instruction was that you should not return before noon the next day. There is a sound within, expressive of surprise. <gasps> and then Clary is heard to answer, I remember it, sir, but I met with a series of accidents which compelled me to return home unexpectedly. That is very unfortunate, says Mr. Peach. I must ask that you quit the house again at once as we agreed. There is a dead man in the parlor wearing your clothes. We shall not discuss it. Mr. Peach hears some movement within and Clary's voice comes again. His face, she says, is not familiar to me though his features are distorted by his last agonies. I insist, says Mr. Peach with some vehemence, that you come away at once. Several light footsteps bring Clary to the cracked door. Heavens, exclaims Mr. Peach, are you not yet dressed? Forgive me, sir, she says, quite without embarrassment at the condition in which she presents herself. The accident I alluded to rendered my clothes very dirty and smoky. I thought to wash them at once. Be so good as to spare your explanations until you are able to make a decent appearance. Your command was to come out of the house immediately. I will not have you indulge Jesuitical sophistries at my expense, Clary. Sir, I wish only to oblige. I shall go back in if you desire it, but is this sight not pleasant to you? I cannot be gratified by the charms of your person when I am disgusted at the abandon by which they are displayed. Go and dress yourself. Well, I shall, though I am surprised to hear these virtuous exhortations when there is a man murdered within. Mr. Peach cannot withhold his protest. It was not I who killed him. Was it not? said Clary. Then we ought both to go indoors. The criminal may yet be abroad. 
or shall we go together to the justice's house? Do you dare to mock me, child? No, sir. Mr. Peach feels his ire rising. It is a sensation as unwelcome to him as it is unfamiliar. You have no right, he says, to presume to know what has been done here or on what cause or to speak a single word about it. You mistake me again, says she. We, have, we fancy we hear the note of gathering passion in her voice also. I do not mock or judge, but let it be so. I shall be silent. You know, sir, I am used to the muzzle. Must you only refrain from talking of things not your concern because you are commanded to? Is there no drop of natural discretion, of decency, of anything in your nature to make you hesitate of your own accord? But why do I even ask the question when you stand thus before me utterly without shame? So far from being abashed at the rebuke, Clary holds her hands straighter and spreads her arms. A wild spirit has entered her, the spirit of midnight and deeds that hide from the sun. What do you see, she cries, that I should be ashamed of, and do not protest to me that you are a married man? Abandoned wretch! Yes, abandoned beyond hope of redemption, and will you now curse me and cast me out as well? You who swore a false oath before my face, and conjure with the dead, and now have done this. Clary gestures into the house behind her with a furious sweep of her arm. Do you, she cries, put on the mask of virtue and shun the vile Miss Riddle? Then I will not stop to fetch the clothes you lent me. No, I quit the house as I am and go naked into the night, for the world is all hypocrisy and deceit, and I will have no more to do with any corner of it. Great heaven, exclaims Mr. Peach. I don't mean to put you out of doors. Is it so much to ask that you dress yourself and conduct yourself with a minimum of consideration? What ill fate rules us tonight that has brought you back to the house and in this spirit, when I only wish to be left to my dreadful business alone? Clary becomes calmer. Perhaps it is the grief in Mr. Peach's cry that tempers her rage. As though for the first time sensible of her appearance, she folds her arms before her. Sir, she says with some hesitation, do you not know? Mr. Peach turns away in despair. I do not understand your meaning, child. You ask what evil power directs us, but I think you know it, as I do. And with that infernal hint, I think we'll leave it. Um, apologies for the interruptions from my cat, by the way. Um, there's little we can do about that. I'd just like to uh, begin with a little round of applause. Um, that was wonderful. Um, and um, yeah, we actually didn't hear your cat at all. Um, oh, honestly, right. these, uh, these microphones only really pick up the most immediate right. things. But uh, that was a, a wonderful reading. Absolutely fantastic. And um, I really hope that we can engage in some Jesuitical sophistries now. More the merrier. Exactly so. So, um, yeah, uh, I suppose yeah, I'd like to begin then with uh, a few questions directly to, to James. And uh, I, I should maybe explain the, the pattern or the structure uh, of what we're going to do from now on. Uh, I'm going to start off with a few questions to James. Then we're going to I'm going to turn to uh, Liz and Fraser and ask them a few questions about their work. Uh, after which we will proceed to talk in a more general way about uh, uh, historical fantasy. Uh, and finally, we'll be turning to you, the audience, uh, to uh, supply us with questions, uh, ideas, thoughts. Uh, and uh, so if you'd like to um, put in your, uh, your ideas into either into the, uh, into the chat or perhaps a little more conveniently into the Q&A, uh, uh, sort of um, section of the uh, of the screen that you'll see in front of you at the at the bottom, I think. Uh, it's certainly at the bottom of my screen, so I think it will be at the at the bottom of yours as well. So please feel free to think up your questions, put them into the uh, uh, into the chat or into the Q and A, and we'll we'll come to them towards the end of the session. So I'm going to begin with some questions to James, uh, and first of all, I'd like to talk about the style. Now, everyone has now heard a sample of that, uh, and it's often been identified as one of the most remarkable things about your novel. It's uh, what you might call uh, an act of necromancy. I think it's what you do call it, <laughs> uh, which is literally the art of raising the dead. 
It's written in a perfect pastiche of 18th century English, complete with spelling and punctuation, which obviously you couldn't read out tonight. Uh, and it's delighted a lot of people. Though I know you had some doubts uh, as to whether such a novel could even be published at all in the 21st century. Though I'm absolutely delighted that it was. So I'd like to begin by asking, what were the challenges of writing in 18th century English? Um, and how did you set about it? Um, the, um, the, whole, the whole enterprise, I think, began with the sort of, the, the, began with discovering the narrator's voice. Um, and in a sense, I think the whole enterprise sort of came out of that narrator's voice. Once I could hear that voice um, sort of clearly in my head, then the rest was almost quite easy. Um, and uh, it, there, there wasn't very much of a challenge because um, it, it sort of wrote itself. I mean, I have, um, as uh, Rob briefly alluded to uh, in his introduction, I, I used to be an academic and um, the field I worked in was um, late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, English literature, and I did spend uh, a large amount of my life reading basically only things that were written between about 1770 and about 1820. Um, so certain things about the kind of sounds and the patterns are, are sort of, you know, kind of tuned into my head. Um, I mean, one thing that should be said is that this is, um, although I think the voice does sort of do quite a good job as sounding as if it might be from you know, sometime around that period. Uh, if you actually read the the writing of that period, it's nothing like this at all. So it's a it's a it's a um it's a very kind of um you know if I've if I've necromantically raised a, a late eighteenth century corpse, um, then it's very kind of mangled and distorted and is kind of shuffling around in some zombie like way, doing very inaccurate things. But um, uh, challenges sort of not really particularly. Um, it, I I didn't find it particularly difficult. I think once 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 the voice was there. Um, One of my favorite suggestions that you just made is that uh, what academics do when they're about to write about a period is to only ever read the literature of that period. That's a, that's a, a kind of a beautiful thought. <laughs> I really, uh, having said that, I think if I were to sit down uh, and, uh, and try and write uh, a pastiche of 16th century prose, for example, I'd find it extremely difficult. Uh, so uh, much harder, um, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, harder, but at the same time, I, you know, uh, I think your task was incredibly hard as well. The other question, I suppose, is um, what what made you want to sort of write uh, what seems to be almost a kind of uh, a, a, a reproduction of of, of an eighteenth century book? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. question. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in the period. I think, um, from the point of view of a, a fantasy writer, which is very much what I consider myself to be, um, I think the appeal. Um, of this particular moment in sort of literary history um, and in kind of intellectual history is that it's, it's you know, it's the, it's the age of enlightenment, it's the age of reason. Um, so they're all kind of, you know, tremendously rational and interested in kind of, you know, experimental method and science and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, they're all completely stark staring mad. And uh, I think this is a very kind of rich, rich um, juxtaposition from the fantastic point of view because you know, fantasy is also interested in the in the kind of the juxtaposition of the the actual and the non-actual, or the possible and the the impossible. Um, so I felt it was a, a good moment for um, for it seemed to it seemed to um, mesh with um, with my interest in, in writing fantastically. Um, and then the specific trigger for it was reading uh, Samuel Richardson's novel Clarissa. Um, which is actually from earlier, it's from the 1750s, I believe I ought to know. Um, and it's gigantically long for anybody who doesn't know, but I, that's why I hadn't got around to reading it before. And one summer I finally got around to reading it. And it's completely astonishing and, and wonderful. And, and, um, and it put, put in my head this idea of uh, the woman who lives by eating paper and drinking ink um, and is herself a kind of um, distorted, sort of zombified um, reproduction of, of Richardson's hero Clarissa and that's the that's the seed from which the story grew. I love that idea and also the ideas it conjures up of um uh, of what is conceived of as a uh, realistic fiction of the kind that Clarissa is maybe one of the um, early examples of 
uh, which which is an um, uh, which is actually filled with uh, massive massive improbabilities and like unlikelihoods, like the idea that Clarissa would have time to sit down uh, and write a thousand pages of letters in the process of living her normal life. Um, but uh, yes, uh, uh, that's so fascinating as it began with Clarissa, because uh, obviously there were you know echoes that I I heard all the way through it. Uh, uh, for instance, Lawrence Stern's. Um, uh, Tristram Shandy and uh, a whole range of other sort of associations, but uh, but uh, but it's uh, yeah. Clarissa obviously plays a, a very central role in the uh, in the book, and uh, we will say more about it for now because it's uh, it's it's too extraordinary a revelation. Um, but uh, I would like to ask uh, um, an, another aspect because you you were speaking about uh, this period as the time of the Enlightenment. Um, but your protagonist is, at least to some extent, a practitioner of magic. Uh, this is the second time you've written about magic. Uh, I said at the beginning that the Advent trilogy imagines magic returning to the world we live in here and now. And it's absolutely wild and terrifying and not human. So uh, that's uh, I, I loved your representation of magic there. Uh, the magic in the Infernal Riddle seems completely different. Um, how would you describe it? And what is it, do you think, about magic that keeps drawing you back? Um, so um, two very good questions. Um, the, uh, the first one, the question of what magic in this book is like, um, I think uh, one of the things that interested me about it was that uh, the magic is sort of almost invisible. Um, and that's partly because the narrator of this book, whose um, voice I hope you sort of got a sense of in, in the extract I read, um, doesn't really want to see it. Um, uh, the narrator appears to be very much embedded in this kind of enlightenment, um, sort of slightly kind of stuffy, slightly kind of self-satisfied, sort of uh, British um, uh, kind of uh, enlightenment era consciousness. Um, and doesn't really like thinking about the fact that actually the world might be full of kind of strange, terrifying, impossible, superstitious things that um, the Enlightenment is supposed to have got rid of. Um, and my hero as well, Thomas Peach, seems to be, even though he clearly is a necromancer, he gets extremely cross whenever anybody accuses him of being a magician. Um, and he refuses to acknowledge to Clary herself that he is a magician, even though she, of all people, knows perfectly well that he is. So I was quite interested in this idea that it's... it's um, it's the thing that uh, nobody sort of really wants to think about. Um, and in that sense, that was rather true of, of uh, the Advent books um, as well. Although of course, in a different way, everybody was kind of forced to. Um, and in the Advent books, what magic does is it, um, it uh, appears and just makes everything else kind of collapse. Um, and I suppose sort of speaking generally, that aspect of magic is what interests me. Um, one of the things I personally find um, unattractive about some fantasy writing or some ideas about fantasy writing is the idea that if you have magic, you have to have a magic system. Um, and this is a kind of cliche that you sometimes hear that people say, oh, well, what's your magic system? Um, and to me, magic is precisely about not having systems. Magic is not just kind of Pache, Arthur C. Clarke. Magic is not just technology by a different name. Um, magic shouldn't have systems and rules. Magic should be what happens when the systems break down and the rules collapse and the things that you can't um, talk about or describe or start happening. I really like that idea. I, I suppose that you could say that um, very often in fantasy, people think of there being two different kinds of fantasy, uh, of, of magic, sorry. Uh, magic, which is a kind of instinctual uh, and is kind of uh, produced out of, uh, out of the body and out of the mind and out of the emotions and the heart and so on. And magic, which is uh, learned from books and studied and so on. What's interesting in your uh, in your text is that you have uh, uh, someone who practices magic very largely on the basis of books, which he keeps carefully locked away. Um, but at the same time, the magic that he practices is uh, recognizably uh, as wild and out of control as the magic that, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that, that is at the center of the Advent trilogy, which is this kind of uh, natural, kind of uh, uh, uncontrolled, inhuman magic, if you like. Uh, that, 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 I mean, that produces a really powerful effect, I think. Um, uh, and and I, I really liked the way that uh, that books feature so prominently all the way through your book. It's uh, it's obviously something that you've really enjoyed. So conjuring up associations of Clarissa uh, with Stern, with um, uh, with maybe uh, Faust. Um, suddenly we've got uh, one character who seems who's completely obsessed with Goethe's sorrows, uh, with Goethe's book 
of the sorrows of young Werther. So it's a it's a wonderfully book um, a book fascinated uh, book, but at the same time it's um it, it's a book uh, which which sort of uh, is all about being out of control and and not being able to not being able to um, cope with, if you like, what books books do to you. Would that be a, a fair description? Well, I think that's a, a beautiful description and exactly right. And I think that's what books are like. I think um, I, I don't kind of get this idea that books are kind of boring and fusty and normal and that, you know, people who are interested in books are sort of boring, fusty, normal people and that, that all the kind of real crazy stuff is happening. Uh, books are extraordinary things. Books books kind of make stuff explode in your head and and sort of you know dissolve the world and and kind of recreate stuff and uh, um and especially if you read things you know written 200 years ago and and um you're making this extraordinary leap across sort of time and consciousness and um getting this tremendous sense of the ways in which the world we live in used to be a completely other world um but uh but it's true of all sorts of books and i i think that's one of the things one of the reasons i love um and I have always loved fantasy is that I think fantasy writing preeminently does that, that it, it um, you know, what, what used to be called the sense of wonder, another way of describing that is that it, it makes sort of the, the extraordinariness of reading, you know, feel extraordinary in, in the most kind of vivid and immediate way. Um, in the way that, you know, if you're me, I know other people feel about this differently, but, you know, if you're me, a, a novel about, I don't know, sort of, novelists living in Brooklyn trying to write their novels and and you know having a difficult time at Thanksgiving dinner or something um to me that doesn't have quite the same sense of evoking the extraordinariness of what writing does whereas with fantasy that's absolutely front and center um which is why I think I've always and still you know, always loved it more than any other genre and, and uh, always will I think I love that idea of fantasy as being about the the, the joy of uh, uh, of language, the joy of reading, and being sort of uh, awakened, if you like, to the uh, uh, to, to things that you thought you knew very well, uh, but actually turn out to be much more astounding, much stranger than you ever thought they were. Uh, and I think you do that with uh, uh, with the period uh, and with the with the, the the people that you present to us in your book. Um, I'd like to maybe uh, turn to Liz and Fraser to to bring them into the discussion a little bit. And uh, I wanted to start by asking Liz uh, a question about uh, her novel, um, Black Snow Falling, uh, which is a story about uh, the stealing of people's hopes and dreams, quite literally, in fact. Um, so, Liz, your invented mythology of the creatures called dream thieves is absolutely fascinating with their capacity to move about or more or less freely through history or through time, looting and pillaging people's unconscious and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, now, you could have set it in almost any historical epoch then. Um, but you chose to set it in the Elizabethan period, uh, the pe period that I, I know well and I'm very fond of. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you'll see that it's it's not for, you know, um, uh, I was I was wondering then why was it the Elizabethan period? I think for a really particular reason, actually, um, part of it is that the most obvious answer is that I grew up near Cheshire in South Manchester and there were loads of Tudor halls around there <laughs> and uh, as a kid I just kind of ran around the grounds to our local one Bramall Hall and was just really fascinated by the sense that real people like me used to live there a long time ago and and I've always loved history and obviously there's a lot of Elizabethan history still around um this by the way is the book I just thought I'd show it off because this is the gorgeous hardback with the lovely black end pages and uh the publisher was just very kind and spending a lot of money on the book, including Nar Millery Sphere there, which is a kind of a motif throughout the novel. But in terms of um, the deeper kind of answer, you're right, it's an idea that could have been set today. And um, I, when I had the idea, I was walking through Glen Etif, actually, um, not even thinking about books. I was talking to a young man who'd... Um, had a really, really hard start in life. I was volunteering for a charity who was helping young people who'd, yeah, who'd just come out of prison or whatever. And, and he was telling me that he wanted to be a gardener. And I was just amazed that despite everything he's been through, he still had this kind of spark in him. And I, I just had this awful what if growing me, like what if 
his dream was a tangible thing that could be stolen away from him. And the whole mythology came to me within about two minutes. <laughs> kind of this whole notion of therefore you'd then have dream thieves who would steal this essence of somebody. I imagined it like a dream halo um, around the head that would be made uniquely for each person. And um, so I could have set it today, absolutely. But I realized that I needed it to be, you know, for somebody to be to risk losing their dream an awful lot of really bad stuff has to happen and in a way I didn't want it to be so melodramatic to place it today that that because there is still quite a big safety net today that all, an awful lot of bad stuff would have to happen and I think it would make it easy, harder for people to relate to so I felt I either had to place it in another culture today or in the past and in the, you know, in the 1500s, we've got kind of the tectonic plates of culture are, are kind of creaking, shifting. And um, you have the very birth of science with the armillary sphere and Copernicus and, and all these things that are seen as being heresy. Um, and yet it's a, it's a time of enormous social change as well with the rise of the middling classes, a, a time when people could actually reasonably hope, a time where there was a woman on the throne, there was a sense of agency for women perhaps. And, um, and so kind of the stakes are very high, but somehow the hopelessness threshold was nearer to, to my characters. So it felt instinctively, and also it's so fantastic, that time is so glorious. It's a glittering, amazing time that, in terms of the uh, fantastic to go with fantasy, it was just a, a wonderful setting. Yeah, uh, I have to agree with you. I, I think it, it works mag magnificently. And I like the way that there's a kind of dialogue uh, between two different times, in fact, uh, within your text. So there's the earlier time of uh, of Henry VIII, there's the time of Elizabeth I, and, uh, um, and, and around them is, and of course, between those two times is mm -hmm. the uh, the generation of all sorts of astonishing scientific ideas, the uh, uh, the rethinking of the position of the Earth in the in the galaxy uh, or, or in the solar system rather. Uh, and uh, and one thing I think that's very touching in the book is uh, is the notion of an encounter between children from two different periods. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that that works wonderfully well. It, it's just kind of a very moving kind of uh, uh, a connection that's forged between a boy and a girl of different classes at different times. Uh, so I, I think it's a it, it's it's a fascinating exercise, and and I, and I think it it works brilliantly. But we'll be we'll be coming back um, to, uh, to to discussing that a little bit uh, uh, the the various issues that you faced when you set it in the Elizabethan period and when you were thinking about the, the earlier Tudor period as well. Um, but I wanted to quickly ask uh, Fraser um, a, a question as well, which is um, obviously I introduced you as deputy director of the historical thesaurus of English. And I know from talking to you and to your lovely colleague, uh, Professor Mark Alexander, that writers of historical fiction have actually used the thesaurus to help them in their work. Um, can you explain to us what it would do for them? Well, um, so it, for anybody who doesn't know, the, which I assume is lots of people, unfortunately, but now you will know, um, the historical thesaurus arranges all the words from the history of the language from Old English to the present day, um, according to their concept, so that rather than looking things up alphabetically, you can look for an idea and find all of the words that have been associated with it over time. So um, we assume that perhaps writers might want to use that to find out you know, whether a word that they're interested in using was available at the time that they are using it, and perhaps, you know, find an alternative word that might suit a better uh, setting the, historically that they're looking at, or possibly even just to use it to sort of get kind of inspiration if they're making up their own words in a sort of uh, historical kind of setting that they might go and look and see what sort of words did people use at that time and so what might I make up that, that might fit with that kind of uh, vibe. Um, so yes and um, I, I know in previous uh, discussion before we started this with James that he was suggesting that finding out what words are not used <laughs> at a point uh, is a useful thing as well just to be able to check that you know the word you've got is not anachronistic as well so yes I hope we uh, people could use it in various ways 
Yes, I remember um, in our conversations uh, before setting, um, um, uh, sitting down together to talk about this, uh, this conversation, um, I, I know that uh, James mentioned uh, the processes that he was going through to find out uh, what language was being, was being used in the, uh, uh, in the late 18th century. Can you describe them now, James? It, it might sort of help to give a sense of where the historical thesaurus might have been really useful. Yes. Um, I mean, I was, as I suggested in one of my earlier answers, I was, I was sort of winging it, um, you know, based on um, uh, my kind of, as it were, over the years, acquired knowledge of that period. Um, and of course, it turns out that lots of the things I winged, um, I, I wonged wrong, as it were. I, I, was, um, I, I made lots of mistakes. Um, I didn't know the historical thesaurus existed, um, to my shame. Um, now I do. And um, it, it, I mean, if somebody, you know, while I was, um, after I'd finished my draft and while I was starting to go through it, thinking about this kind of thing specifically, if somebody had told me that uh, this resource was there, it would have, um, it would have been the, the happiest day of my life. But uh, <laughs> um, sadly, I, I, I did it the kind of uh, the drudgery way by just looking up citations in the OED um, and, and finding out when words were used. Um, and of course, I could only do that when I thought I might have made a mistake. And there were probably mistakes in there that, you know, I hadn't picked up. Um, but as I say, it's partly just a question of kind of the tone rather than strict accuracy, I think. I mean, I want it to be accurate because I think, you know, if you try to do that, then it, it sort of makes you more likely to, to get your tone right. Um, but I remember, overall, I remember I think you Sorry, I was remem remembering you saying that you 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 really wanted to get in certain words and certain uh, phrases which you really loved from the period. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, exactly. Um, and there's and certain kind of manners. Um, the um one of the 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 kind of inspirations for for my narrator was um the narrator of um Fielding's um indescribably wonderful novel Tom Jones, which um uh, I, I hope um. Some of uh, people in our audience um, may know, and if they don't and are interested in in reading uh, great novels written in English, um, Tom Jones is, is an unbelievably wonderful book, um, partly because it's incredibly funny and it has this fantastically grumpy narrator um, who's rather kind of patrician and, um, and uh, um, not pompous exactly, but slightly kind of contemptuous of everybody else. Um, and 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 profoundly kind of conscious of his uh, it's definitely a he uh, of his own um uh, his own kind of you know superiority to most of his characters which sounds rather unpleasant but it's in fact wonderful because he's also very humane um and that 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 kind of tone was something i wanted to catch slightly in in my narrator as well um and then you mentioned stern's um, also wonderful but rather more difficult novel the life and opinions of tristram shandy and that had some certain kind of quirks of tone that I also wanted to catch. So, um, so it's partly a kind of homage to, to, to the, as it were, the, the general kind of feel of, of those kind of books rather than specific questions of getting the right vocabulary. But of course, getting the right vocabulary is, as it were, the, um, the, 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 the kind of fine grained tool work that you need in order to, to produce the, the proper tone. Yes, I, was, uh, I just recently discovered that uh, um... First of all, Lovecraft was obsessed with the 18th century, apparently. And secondly, and perhaps more cheerfully, uh, so was Mervyn Peake's, one of Mervyn Peake's favourite novels was The uh, Life and, uh, and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. So there are definitely fantasy associations already with the late 18th century. Liz, I was thinking um, in, when I was reading uh, Black Snow Falling, uh, I was uh, you make a, a different set of choices in terms of language, um, and yet you do invoke the sense that uh, that what you're writing is uh, a language which is consonant with what we feel to be the right language for the 16th century. What kind of uh, questions and, and, and problems did you find yourself uh, facing as you as, as you were inventing your version of the 16th century? Well, gosh, my word, I rewrote the novel endless times. Um, rewrites up to here, probably. I mean, I wrote it over a period of about 12 years, to be honest. Um, I was a single mum and working full time. And so I was just doing it in the edges of the day. And 
the you know the narrative style changed enormously over that period of time partly because I was just growing as a writer because it's my first novel and lots of first writer lots of first no debut novelists um have written lots of novels to get to the first one that's published and <clears throat> I just rewrote the same one many times um <clears throat> I was very aware I, I think because I'm a copywriter by trade so um that is you know working in advertising as a writer that was what I used to do um and still do a little bit for clients um I um I'm just I'm a very instinctive writer and I kind of have a good nose for ideas and and audiences to fit ideas so I knew that when I had this idea that it would fit a YA and that adult crossover but mostly YA I felt whereas the idea I'm working on now is definitely for adults and um has a very very different voice to, to Blackstone Falling but in terms of this I I just felt that because um it's a very complex idea with multiple timelines it felt right to have quite a conventional narrative style um, to make in a way the narrative quite accessible. So although the diction is quite elevated, you know, it uses quite complex language, but I, I try to keep it in a way as simple and as clear as possible. To me, I always feel like a piece of prose needs to, unless, unless there's a deliberate strategic reason not to, should be like a glass of water, which you just down in one go you know it just should, it should flow smoothly and and I think that's probably the style of black snow falling because because of all the complexity it just kind of pulls you through and it's got a um, very strong plot that just grabs you hopefully from the from the first page um because the stakes feel quite high Yes, the stakes are definitely high. So you will definitely need to read it to, 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 to guess just how high they are, especially you don't find out till quite a lot, uh, quite late on in, in the novel, um, just how high, how high they are. Um, so I'd like to maybe talk a little bit more broadly about uh, historical fiction. Um, and uh, first of all, I, sorry, historical fantasy is what I meant. Um, and my first question is precisely about that. Obviously, we all know how popular historical fiction is. I mean, Hilary Mantle and uh, um, uh, Pat Barker and all sorts of writers uh, sort of uh, 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 evidence of that. But uh, what can fantasy bring to the mix? Um, I mean, James has spoken this about this a little, uh, but uh, in terms of historical fantasy, um, what, what is it that, that, uh, that, that um, fantasy brings to historical fiction? It's a really good question. Um, I think the past, is such a different country that it feels like in a way like a fantasy in itself because it doesn't feel like today um, but I think that what's going on you know what really excites me particularly about the current novel is this sense of historicized um, character building and sense of self and and you know looking at the very heterogeneous culture in Britain in which I'm writing the very contrasting culture um, it's so rich in in information that somehow bringing together, um, um, you know, uh, by kind of looking at the past with the help of the fantasy, um, somehow we can clean our lenses for, for looking into the future. Um, so, for instance, you could you can look at themes like misogyny, um, which I explore in both novels. Um, which is still having a very real impact today. And these things are important. So to me, you know, truth is important. And so, so kind of truth coupled with myth, I think is a very powerful combination because in a way myth is just a kind of a, a bigger truth in a way, it's a deeper truth. There's a, is a way of linking the seen with the unseen. And um, even in the sense of, um, just in terms of our, our imagination, where somebody's thoughts go, that's that's the start of fantasy, isn't it? That that's the very beginning of it. Um, so the truth, as far as we can establish it, so I'm kind of going around a bit all over the place, but is I think to me really really important. Um, and yes, yeah, so, but coupling it with fantasy, well, for me, magical realism is what I love. It makes it a really interesting texture. Yeah, I am. Um, that's interesting. I mean, I I always feel that. Um, I feel like I, I would love to be somebody who writes about um, important things, um, uh, truth, uh, as Liz calls it, which is a good word for it, I think. Um, but uh, it turns out I, I'm sort of can't. <laughs> um, but uh, it, and it's it's not a you know it's not a, it's not something I I don't sort of have any rules about what I think writing should do apart from you know trying to make good sentences. Um, which is hard enough. Um, 
but um uh even if I if I if I did think I I was kind of obliged, as it were, to to um to face up to the the important um issues, um, uh, it turns out that my writing just won't do that. No, no matter how much I kind of want it to, my writing is always kind of you know making going uh, going somewhere else. Um, uh, being uh, you know I'm trying not to use the word escapist because it's such a loaded word in the context of of fantasy, but um. Uh, it, it seems to the, the the kind of initial gesture for me always seems to be some kind of evasion or or some kind of um, uh, flight, like you know you, you kind of open the wardrobe door and you're in the kind of beautiful kind of forest of snow and there's a fawn wandering around, um, and and that feels to me like the the kind of founding gesture. Um, I'm not saying it should be or should be for other writers, but that's that's what it's always like for me, you know, whether I want it to be or not. Um, and I, I just sort of hope that you come to kind of truth by the back door, as it were, that you end up there eventually. But I don't know whether you, you know, I don't know whether you do or not. I, I sort of very, I've, I very much feel that, you know, writers sort of write what they what they can. And, um, and, and you just sort of, you know, you hope that <laughs> you hope that you end up with something that resonates with other people um, one way or another. I think it's really important that the books aren't didactic. You know, we, we can be taught by things elsewhere that kind of that kind of there always is a reader author gap. So so people can actually bring their own reading to things. Um, so, but I, I I know I know what you mean. Um, stories. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm just going to say I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by your both of your different takes in a sense because um, Liz, you're speaking about uh, uh, myth and mythology, uh, and uh, James, you're speaking about yourself as uh, uh, if you like unable to speak to or invo uh, so involve yourself in the grand narratives. Although one has to say grand narratives emerge from your work constantly. Um, but uh, one thing that's that's kind of fascinating about uh, um, uh, about mythology and myth is uh, that there's this strong sense uh, that uh, you can't really start talking about myth mythology uh, until it's kind of in the past, until it's something that has happened at one point. So in a sense, you could say that uh, uh, and, and mythology uh, for us now is possibly what was religion in the past in certain ways. Um, so uh, I suppose one of the questions then would, would be sort of whether... Um, uh, you know whether everyone is uh, yeah I, I suppose that it's a it's a it's it's kind of different approaches to it but I think that both of you come to it in the end to to to, to sort of a, to some kind of agreement about it in certain ways so James yours might be a, a, a literature of the practical day-to-day -day needs uh, which uh, which often are confronted by uh, radically different and shocking events which uh, you might identify as the uh, uh, as the fantastic events, um, Liz. You you sort of seem to me to be addressing sort of uh, um, uh, people who enter into much larger stories than they expected to be involved in, and if you like, start to recognize that that's what's happening to them. Whereas in James's work, there's much more a sense that there's a struggle not to recognize it, to not be involved in anything that happens to be much larger. I was noticing the way that Thomas Peach, for instance, really isn't terribly sympathetic to the various revolutions that are going on all around him uh, it, because he has other things on much more practical day-to-day -day problems on his mind. So it's a, it's a really interesting kind of, uh, rival or, or kind of uh, connected but but approaching from different angles uh way of writing of writing historical fantasy yeah i mean i think one of the interesting things about fantasy is that it does tend to deal with quite large scale um you know the stakes tend to be quite high fantasy is quite interested in situations where you know the world itself is under threat or some sort of um some sort of uh, very great evil is is um is, is present. Fantasy uh, is quite interested in these quite, um, as it were, overblown, not in a pejorative sense, but these, these, these kind of quite melodramatic situations, um, uh, which is again another thing that I admire and, and like about the genre. But, but I think you're quite right to say, Rob, that you can uh, arrive there in, in sort of quite different ways. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I notice about when I'm writing is that I, I I find baddies sort of very difficult to conceptualize. And I, I haven't yet written a book uh, which has someone gigantically evil um, in it. Um, that it just doesn't so it doesn't quite sort of, you know, lay hold of, lay hold of my imagination in that way. 
Um, so as you say, it's more to do with sort of, you know, the, the individual moment of the story, which might then trigger some confrontation with these large scale issues, but that tends not to be where I start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> interesting point. Yeah, I think um, it's quite interesting how I think uh, language um, is, I'm quite fascinated by how it is kind of magical and how it has its own, how, how it has its own internal magic. Uh, how, how sorry, how it has its own internal logic, how it takes you somewhere. So say the idea that came to me um, of the dream thieves, um, to me, it feels like, I think it speaks to fear, which I think is a big issue today. You know, we are in an Anthropocene, we are in unstoppable climate change, you know, like it or not, that's a frightening context to be in, whether or not we connect with that fear, whether we zone out from it or just numb ourselves against it you know we have um i, I think there's no coincidence that there's an increasing am appetite for, for for fantasy fiction and magical realism i think possibly because you know dystopias have become the future that's that that's what we're moving into there's no way of stopping that um other than adapting and mitigating um and i i think so for that reason i believe that you know stories that engage with the reality of that it, at some level even if it's by looking at the past um equip us for for, for handling that it, you know Jung talked about this a lot um you know he looked at myth and you know in the context of our clever enlightenment and post-enlightenment place and indeed post-secular place and and kind of um, you know, he, he talks enormously about how we need a story that's bigger than us, that, that we can somehow fall into and lean into in order to see ourselves through that. We do need story. We're, we're all, you know, we're living stories with a beginning, middle and end. And I, I think we need narratives, we being people, we need narratives around us. You know, we tell stories all the time, don't we, to each other that, that help us make sense of life. I'd like to ask... Um... Picking up on the on the on the question of uh, what fantasy adds to fiction, and I both I think you both uh, responded very eloquently. Um, the what, one question which uh, which I'm sure both of you have thought a lot about is the question of um, what um, how important is accuracy in historical fantasy? Um, uh, I would say not very. Um, but that's because I did literally zero research. So, um, but it, it depends on the reader, I suppose. Um, but I, I, as I said, um, uh, this relates to a question that I see in the Q&A from Meg McDonald, who has asked about how, um, how uh, uh, you can um, uh, kind of build a, a, an other world and an, an other culture um, without simply kind of, you know, falling into this um, explanatory mode where you're just kind of, you know, saying lots of things of what's going on. Um, and I think, I think it's to do with tone, as I, as I was saying before, rather than accuracy, I think rather than sort of specifically, you know, getting things uh, right, I think you, you have to get the feel, you have to make it feel like it's coherent um, at its, you know, somewhere else, as it were. Um, and as I, you know, as I, as I've already said, I mean, my, my book is not, um, uh, the Thomas Peach is not an, an accurate, it doesn't sound like any late 18th century fiction. And in fact, the narrator appears to be writing from a few generations later as somewhere in the 1840s or something. It sounds even less like writing of the 1840s. So it's not accurate, but I think what it, you know, hopefully what it does do is sound like it might be accurate. Um, so it has to have that kind of plausible, plausibility. Now you can lose that if you make a really bad kind of anachronism um, or if you, you know, if you have people speaking in the wrong way or having the wrong attitudes, um, or if you put the wrong kind of, you know, technological stuff in, then the tone can crack quite quickly, I think. Um, so, uh, but I, I think, you know, per se, I don't think accuracy is, is what one is aiming at. I think one's aiming at something else. I guess I, again, this is really interesting because I have a different view entirely, um, <clears throat> probably also because I'm doing a PhD in the period, but I, I kind of, to me, because again, I think probably because being a copywriter, you know, the watchword for me as a copywriter was about being sincere and simple. You know, there's, um, I, I really, 
really respect the power of language. You know, we look at saying national origin myths and what people believed in the past and the way that, say, the Brutus myth was used to, to, to justify invasions of Scotland. So I feel an important sense, uh, feel an important responsibility for, for respecting the power of, 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 of kind of what was really going on at that time, because it's so immensely interesting as well. And um, I think takes us to a place of alterity, that again, in terms of magical realism is really useful. Um, and so, um, and also I'm really aware that even for straight historical novelists like Hilary Mantel, she gets a bad rap by various historians for, you know, the wallpaper being wrong or something, you know, and uh, let alone when you're introducing magical creatures into something, you know. So I, I think it, it's it's just, it. I don't know, I, I just feel a respect for, um, you know, again, truth only as much as, as as far as it can be established is is interesting and it's worth honoring and maybe that's also to do with part of my own journey you know that I, I think that's important and obviously I'm the writer I am because of the things that I've been through and um, that's possibly why I'm slightly more serious writer I don't know but um, it's um, yeah but also it's it's about you know there's an awful lot of entertainment in that in those times as well so drawing on that is great Picking up on uh, on what um, uh, what what's been said about tone, I noticed it's Jacob G using the term, um, uh, saying that uh, I tend to describe the goal of historical fiction as achieving very similitude. I quite like that word. Uh, sort of, it, it does give that idea of uh, of accuracy uh, up or appearing to be accurate. I also love the fact that there are writers like um, T. H. White in the world. Uh, or were anyway, uh, and uh, uh, who uh, sort of made a bit of a specialism of anachronism. Uh, if you put in a character who lives backwards, uh, then uh, then you have, uh, if you like, a kind of way of mediating between the needs of your contemporary reader and the uh, uh, and the representation of a past that works. And what's amusing about uh, about T. H. White is that he's writing a, a novel, The Sword in the Stone which is set uh, in the, the time of uh, King Arthur, who was, um, you know, a descendant of Brutus, uh, you know, who came and invaded Scotland. And also before that, he invaded, invaded Britain. Um, but uh, the whole novel is set in what is clearly 15th century England, uh, which is what, uh, what happened with, with Mallory. Uh, Mallory sort of adapted the Arthurian legends uh, to be completely suitable to the time that he lived in. Um, so there's this, uh, this idea of anachronism is already built into T.H. White's sources in a really fascinating way. Um, I guess, uh, in a way, that, that that's something that, um, uh, that you achieve with your voice, James, in that you use a, uh, uh, an 18th century voice, which at the same time seems to have knowledge of things that have happened since the 18th century. It's a very fascinating kind of uh, technique. So it's kind of like a, a Merlin voice from the 18th century, if you like. That was actually one of the things that... Um... My editor, who's who's lovely, and and she didn't sort of want to interfere too much with the the sort of stylistic and chronological things because um, she felt she wasn't quite qualified to. Um, but she was quite concerned about figuring out exactly when the narrator was located because there are various things that that the narrator refers to, and and so we did. I did have to um, uh, try and sort of you know get that you know like how recently was Napoleon dead? You know, is it plausible that the narrator you know, hasn't really heard of Beethoven or thinks that Beethoven is a kind of niche interest. Um, uh, the narrator refers to Britain as an Im imperial country. Um, you know, is that is that sort of right for, you know, early Victorian times? So things like that, I, I did work on sort of quite carefully, sort of rather than, rather than the overall stylistic points. Um, but yes, I, so I do, I do, you know, in my head have quite an exact sense of when the narrator is is located, you know, how many years after the event he or she is writing. Um, but uh, that's one of the few things that I did try and sort of pin down quite carefully chronologically. There's a really, I sorry, uh, the, uh, I was just gonna say there's a really interesting question by uh, Vi here in the, um, in the Q and A, which is, uh, can we say that the point of view of how you encounter historical fantasy offers different dimensions? Uh, as an author, is historical fantasy a bit like conscious time travel? For the reader, perhaps, the travel or movement is much more subtle and invisible. You simply end up there. 
Um, I love that idea of historical fantasy as a form of conscious time travel. Um, what, what do you think about the, the, the different points of view that you can use? And can you think of examples of, of uh, uh, different points of view that, uh, that, that you've enjoyed in historical fantasy? I think I'm just answering the point more generally. Um, I think uh, one of the things that fantasy tends to do is to sort of whoosh you instantly sort of somewhere else. Um, I mean, to take, you know, two famous examples, you know, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. You know, well, what? You know, what's a hobbit? You know, that, that, that kind of one sentence sort of whooshes you beautifully and instantly to somewhere which is, you know, not here, as it were. So you don't know where it is, uh, but you know it's not here. Um, and I think, uh, you know, even more wonderfully, the island of Gaunt is famous for its wizards. Um, which is, you know, one of the, the great opening lines of, uh, it's the opening line for those who don't know of um, Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea books. Um, and is, is completely brilliant because, you know, here you are, somebody giving you kind of encyclopedic sort of factual type information about the island of Gaunt, which, you know, didn't exist in the second before you read that line and now does, and not only does, but is notorious for wizards. <laughs> for these things which are you know treated as um suddenly you know it's like like i don't know sort of london being famous for fog or something it's, 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 this cliche has suddenly arrived fully formed in one sentence in your world so you're displaced instantly um but at the same time kind of grounded and anchored it's like you know this other point of view has just been kind of dropped on you beautifully and instantaneously um and and without apology or explanation it's 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 kind of an automatic part um, and I love that about fantasy. I love the, the way that fantasy kind of can, you know, can instantly do that to you um, in a way that other writing, other kinds of writing, you know, don't necessarily want to. Absolutely. And of course, it, you know, it has its origins, doesn't it, in Middle English and Middle Scots and, and no doubt in other cultures, that it, there would have been dream vision poetry around as well. And so I've been reading a lot of Piers Plowman and um, just it's fantastic how point of view is used in that and how um, how you have dreams within dreams. It was just like inception, you know, these ideas are really old, you know. Um, so um, yeah, just how, you know, it, point of view is used really deftly even, you know, you know 600 years ago. So um, it certainly adds a lot of texture. I really liked the idea of the traveler in time that Vi introduced there. And funnily enough, um, Liz, one of the uh, associations that I had with your novel was a, a great time travel novel by Alison Utley from about uh, 1939, which is called A Traveller in Time, about a girl of her own time who goes to an Elizabethan mansion and finds herself propelled backwards to the time of Mary Queen of Scots and starts eavesdropping on the relationship between Mary Queen of Scots and uh, and the Babington conspiracy, which is gradually unfolding. Oh, or at least I've never read that. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful book and, uh, and it definitely, you know, the, the house that you locate uh, Black Snow Falling In, especially at the beginning, uh, has this very strong kind of uh, uh, association with, for me, with, with Alison Nutley's uh, uh, sort of house, which, which she represented there, which was based on a, a, on a real house. Oh, um, it might have been the same one, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be funny. Interestingly, though, I mean, the idea of time travel is rather interesting because uh, um, it, it, it raises the question of how you mediate between now and the past. It's maybe something that, that we've mentioned already a, a couple of times. But um, uh, so uh, it, it, it's, um, uh, I mean, what one example of that is that uh, when he first wrote, uh, when he was writing The Lord of the Rings, uh, trying to work out how to do it, uh, Tolkien at one point tried out a technique of, uh, uh, of having a modern person time travel back to the period that he's, that he's writing about. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it is always a, a form of time travel, obviously, historical fiction or historical fantasy. Um, but the question of whether you actually use time travel is uh, a really interesting one. Uh, is that something either of you has been uh, tempted by? Um, um, for me, no. So I'll, I'll turn this over to Liz. OK, thanks, James. Um, time travel is, um, do you mean using it in the story? <laughs> 
just um yeah just uh well I think I do I think I do and and certainly one of the one of the ideas that I had that I discarded was the idea of actually going inside a dream and and coming out somewhere else and and it it just became like it was it just felt like it was growing arms and legs and so I kind of disc but I had written a couple of chapters like that and I just discarded them um so I think it's um you know I've always you know when I was a kid I used to think about you know the possibility of ghosts and things and I used to think you know but surely time doesn't go constantly in one direction smoothly surely you might get little hiccups in time which of course now is a familiar concept today but um just you know you know maybe a ghost is when when you have a little blip with the past you know when there's a hiccup or again an um an alien is using someone from the future or I don't know I mean <laughs> it's just a slightly mad idea but that but that fed into the science fiction that fed into Black Snow Falling Yes, absolutely. I, I, I love the, I mean, the, the, the time travel component is definitely there. Interestingly, you take us into the past immediately in exactly the way James described, and then have time travel taking place within the context of the past, which is rather an unusual maneuver. Um, I, I was thinking, I was actually um, uh, thinking uh, that, uh, you know, a, a, a couple of, uh, I actually had a really good question in my mind, but it's completely vanished again. But uh, um, one question which I really liked that James uh, suggested to us that we could all have a, a quick talk about, um, I, I'd like to ask specifically to Fraser, first of all, which is, um, he, he may be horrified by this, but uh, is language magic? <laughs> I like to think it is in some ways. Yes, there are loads of uh, sort of ways that, yeah, it, it helps you conjure up those ideas, those different times as you've been sort of talking about. And um, the way that uh, James uses kind of all aspects of language in his novel is sort of like, um, you know, punctuation, syntax, levels of formality and stuff like that, you know, really brings that sort of um, to life. And I love there's, there's a bit where um, he makes a sort of joke that you can tell um, how you know that it's a bad time to be facing a particular character because not only through their tone but also their syntax <laughs> and it's like, it fantastic that it gives you an idea without even having to have their language of um, you know just what can be conveyed about uh, somebody and, and uh, setting through it and the use of stuff like um, bibliomancy and things like that to sort of like say that language can sort of have this predictive effect or sort of almost influence once you've read it, it influences how you then perceive your own reality. Um, yeah, the, the sort of great. And um, yes, and uh, Liz's as well, obviously, that sort of like is much more sort of, um, as she says, clear in a sort of like really readable and straightforward way, but has that kind of those hints of the past in it and has occasional, you know, I'm a sucker obviously for old words. And so the fact that she's got, you've got occasionally things like, is it Poulian or something? You have some amazing like 16th century insult in there. Or oh, yeah, had fun with those. Kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Lots of Shakespeare so... invent it really for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, swear, no. Words, swear words are the best, I think, with them. Absolutely. With, uh, historical <laughs> language, rude stuff. It, it always just sounds, I mean, it sounds pretty right. Swear words are good in contemporary English too, but in, in, um, yeah, in, in historical language, somehow they, they're always the richest, aren't they? It's what we're sure about 90% of the people using the thesaurus are looking for. So, <laughs> yeah. Like every other dictionary, right? So. <laughs> yes, it's really what they exist for. They're looking up the rude words, yeah. <laughs> yeah i um yeah i mean i was i was interested when um when liz was talking about the the kind of ideal of languages sort of clarity um and the ideal of, of writing prose that is is quite kind of limpid um which i absolutely totally agree with um but can't do <laughs> and i've i've discovered this about myself i just can't do it i can only write quite knotty um, uh, quite kind of over elaborate uh, language that that sort of gets between that you know is visibly there kind of you know physically between the reader and and, and what I'm trying to say um, and I wish I couldn't 
I, I wish I, I wish I was a sort of better writer in that sense, but I'm not. Um, so I'm I'm kind of stuck with this sort of sense that um, that language is actually this kind of amazing, um, sort of richly textured, um, sort of musical thing that is constantly kind of drawing attention to itself. Um, and um, and since you know since I am stuck with that, then that's that's kind of um, you know that that becomes my sense of of sort of how it works and 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 um, and uh, and what it does. Um, and therefore, I think it is quite magical because, of course, you know, language is this language is the way we understand and, and interact with the world. But of course, it's not neutral. It's it it you know it gets it it does things. Um, and and the the kind of richer and stranger it is, and the the richer and stranger the things that it does are too. So. Yeah. It's so interesting that uh, that you say that um, about your own language and your books are filled, particularly the um, uh, Thomas Peach is filled with people who are in some sense possessed by language. Uh, they're, they're taken over by it. Uh, so the idea that your, your language is something which is uh, always getting in the way and taking command of, pe uh, of people's voices is, is something that works superbly, as a, as, even as a, a plot device uh, as much as anything else in, in the course of the, of the present novel. Um, I, I did. Uh, I was thinking that there's a couple of, uh, of of questions I'd like to jump into uh, from the from the question and answer. There's an interesting one about games uh, from Yolanda. Uh, do you believe the thirst for rethinking reality through the mirror of fantasy is at the root of the rise in interest in tabletop games such as Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder? I'm interested in this because uh, my own children, have, uh, particularly my son, have, have become really interested in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It clearly is having a, an enormous uh, sort of um, uh, explosion of popularity right now. Um, and I'm curious as to uh, as, as to whether these uh, uh, these table ta tabletop games have an affinity with the kinds of historical fiction that we're describing today. Um. Yes, I, I I can't speak to the question of affinity, although I think it's a very interesting question. But it's a, I'm I'm delighted that Yolanda has pointed this out um, because I've noticed it too, very strikingly, um, and it utterly delights me. You know, as somebody who spent my entire mid-teens doing nothing but playing Dungeons and Dragons, literally, it was, <laughs> it was my life. That and reading. You know, that was all I wanted to do. Um, I'm 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 incredibly delighted that it's come back. I don't know whether it's part of a general um, uh, sense that fantasy is having a moment. Um, fantastical television is now of extremely high quality um, and very interesting and very popular. Um, I think some fantastical films are, are, are getting, uh, getting better. Um, there's been some, uh, some, some wonderful things done recently. Um, it seems to be quite kind of mainstream um, I mean, no, when um, when Rob and I were were teens uh, or sort of early twenties when we first knew each other, um, it was still not unusual for one to have to take a slightly defensive standpoint about fantasy. Um, so, if you said you were interested in fantasy, you had to be prepared to be mocked um, and accused of being, you know, sort of only interested in Amazonian women in iron bras or. or um, <laughs> Or, or, um, or just being kind of escapist, or people would tell you, well, you know, I think you ought to pay attention to the real world instead, or whatever. And that that whole kind of discourse has, has vanished now. I think it's something that, uh, my sense anyway, is that people don't apologize for it anymore. Um, and I love it that the the younger generation are spending their time playing D and D. You know, especially a non a non computer game. I'm mean, not that I've got anything against computer games. I love computer games, but. But I think I think it's wonderful that um, that kids are interested in something that's pen and paper and words and their imaginations. I think this is fantastic. It's interesting. I, I have to confess that I've never played Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that. And I haven't even actually read a shock horror Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I've watched the films. I kind of grew up not not being drawn to fantasy fiction, so it's a it's really amazing that I had this idea that then kind of threw me into that world. But in a way, it was quite good because I wouldn't allow myself to read um, Harry Potter or, or Philip Pullman's um, His Dark Materials, which is a, aimed at the same age bracket as Blackstone and Falling throughout that. And but then when I got to it, I absolutely loved it. And um, so I've been a very latecomer to all of this and found it 
oneric and gorgeous and wonderful really just um but um so there's not much i can contribute to that conversation unfortunately well i think um, I, I think when when you know i was getting into it um uh in the in the 80s I think literally no one who was female played Dungeons and Dragons. It oh, was, really? It was, a kind of, it was a nerdy boy thing. And that's completely not true uh, now, um, which is also one of the, you know, the great pleasures about its, its rediscovery, I think, that it, it's no longer a, a kind of, you know, a badly gendered um, activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really pleasing development, I have to say. Um, I do want to uh, pick up on a really good question from Jacob in the question and answer, which is uh, this. Uh, what historical events in your lifetimes would you want to see included in a historical fantasy and why? Um, and uh, I see that um, he asks all panelists to answer. So I want to ask Fraser that question. What historical events in your lifetime would you want to see included in a historical fantasy, do you think? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I think um, for me, I mean, there are all sorts of, when you ask that question, dreadful things spring to mind, but about the sort of, maybe like the turn of the millennium where we all thought something dramatic would happen even if it was like the millennium bug or something like that and planes would fall out of the sky or something and I think I would like to see that revisited and something more fantastical happen than actually did uh, maybe um, for me Sorry, go ahead, Liz. Sorry. Um, for me I am I, um, Again, it's the climate, I think, you know, it's, you know, some kind of cop event, you know, as in, you know, probably the Paris cop, I don't know, and, re, you know, kind of relocating that in another context, um, uh, an absolute pivotal time. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually typed an, an answer uh, when I saw that question come up. Um, and I think um, uh, Grace's remark in the chat is a bit um is a bit the point i was getting at uh, for me none i have i have i have no interest in my own lifetime I, I don't want to see my own lifetime in fantasy um that's one of the things i like about fantasy is that it's not this stuff um i it may be inexcusable but the older i get the 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 less i want to think about the um the deep appallingness of everything and, and the more i want to read clarissa <laughs> I certainly I'm really enjoying being the 1400s at the moment. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, it was probably pretty shit in the 1400s, but uh, but, yeah. but, 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 but at least it's you know from our point of view, it's a, it's a different thing. So. I think what, what, I, what I was going to say, which, which I've discovered uh, as a teacher, is um, that there comes a moment in your life when you suddenly realise you are historical. Uh, so, uh, so, and, and you represent a voice from the past, and that uh, what you have to say is interesting precisely because it's it, it reveals such bizarre things, you know, that uh, that, uh, that students uh, of of a you know post millennial uh, age uh, or even just pre millennial uh, just can hardly believe. Like, for instance, there was a time when there were no mobile phones and things like that. So, I suspect you could pick almost anything from your lifetime which was uh, extravagantly ridiculous to contemporary readers if you live long enough um so uh, uh, I, I i suspect i'd probably want to write a historical fantasy that was based in maybe the 1970s because it's so absolutely packed with strange and wonderful things um smog for example you know the excitement of smog uh, and the fact that everybody was intensely aware of the environment uh, you know and everybody thought that something really must urgently be, do be done about it uh, you know it's, it, it, this alone is something absolutely fascinating about the 1970s but there are plenty others as, uh, plenty of others as well the you know things which are kind of uh, which co contemporary events are, are deeply rooted in so my answer to you know, uh, to to um uh, to, to the question uh, to uh, is is probably simply that uh, I uh, um, I'd, I'd, I'd want to choose something from early on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one of the things that's um, it's not quite really answering the question, but uh, came up for me as Rob was talking there was uh, one of the things that's really lovely, that is really lovely about the 1400s is, um, so I'm focusing a lot of the story on the Gallic Lords of the Isles who are on the Western coast of Scotland. And, um, can you believe that then poets were actually the second most powerful people in society 
and the second most highly paid beyond, the, you know, beneath the Lord of the Isles. Isn't that astonishing? Um, so, you know, it's completely flipped around now that I think probably poets and writers are the worst paid of anybody. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's quite fascinating, you know. I did have one last question, I, I think, because uh, there are, um, uh, we haven't got very much time left. But my quick question for the panelists was, uh, which historical fantasists or writers of historical fantasy uh, they would recommend to the people who are here today? Go ahead, Liz, because um, uh, I don't actually read very much, so I'm not terribly well qualified to answer this, but I'll try in a moment. Uh, yeah, I mean, I must admit, I don't really, this is awful, I don't really read any historical fantasy um kind of i read historical fiction and i've read fantasy fiction and um uh so and and also i'm so immersed in the in the period that i'm writing about i can't really come out of that so i'm kind of had to be incredibly selective about what i write so at read rather so you know i'm reading a lot of middle english dream vision poetry and kind of you know the contemplatives like julian of norwich and nicholas of cusa um and and they are extraordinary and they are you know historical and very imaginative so um my appetite is satiated with that um yeah Frances harding i see someone has just mentioned that very good point she's a fantastic writer and i thoroughly endorse Frances harding i really really enjoyed her work when i read it yes i think um i think i think our audience are probably going to be a better resource yeah than, totally <laughs> than we are i also read very little when i'm working which is most of the time um in case you know somebody else somebody else has writing gets into my head and I can't get it out. Exactly, exactly. you have to protect your head, don't you? Absolutely. I love it that you both have uh, come together on this uh, uh, on this agreement that basically the, the greatest his historical fantasy you both uh, want to read is is historical fiction. It's kind of all, you know, work from the past is, mm -hmm. is, is itself for us always and everywhere uh, historically fantastic. Um, so I, actually, I, I really like that thought. To be honest, that's now almost all I read is <laughs> you know, 18th century writing. Um, there's so much of it that I, you know, I first read my first Fanny Burney novel quite recently. It's completely wonderful. And there are, there are lots more and they're all gigantic. So, you know, it's a... I love the fact that my my daughter's just been reading Fra Fanny Burney as kind of fan or, or as, as, as a way of getting more Jane Austen, basically. It was kind of, uh, yeah, she was fed up that there were only a few Jane Austens. So it was necessary to start reading all the others with, like Fanny Burney. Um, I was just going to mention a few names. Uh, I love, uh, if you look, look at time, his, uh, historical fiction, the tr tr fantasy that goes through time, then probably Octavia Butler, Butler's Kindred is is one of my very favorites. Um, it's painful, but it's, it's a, an astonishing feat. Um, Francis Harding, I definitely had on my list. I've already mentioned um, uh, Alison Utley, uh, the tra a traveler in time, and there are a lot of other wonderful time travel historical fantasies uh, from Patricia uh, Pierce's uh, Tom's Midnight Garden through to, uh, um, well, uh, there doesn't, Lucy Bot Boston's uh, Green Noah books would be a really good example. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention um, a, a name that many of you will be familiar with, who is one of my very favorite historical fantasy writers, uh, and that's Joan Aiken uh, and her uh, alternative history of the early uh, 19th century. And she seems to be a, a perfect example of somebody who is really good at capturing the tone, the voice of somebody who's writing in the 19th century, uh, but uh, but at the same time making it entirely accessible, somehow mediating it for us in a way, uh, perhaps partly by by using the idea of uh, of melodrama that to a great extent uh, James was invoking in the passage that he read to us right at the beginning, which has that, uh, that wonderful kind of uh, uh, melodramatic tone from time to time snatched from the Gothic novels that were being written around about the same time as, uh, uh, as some of the other texts that we've been describing. Um, well, I, I'm, I think we're, we're- Can I just say a quick thank you to uh, all the suggestions are, or, that are pouring in from the audience, which I'm trying to take note of as, as they come including in. Including my agent there, Lindsay Fraser. Hi, Lindsay, who's um, mentioned Silverskin by Joan Lennon, which is very good. Sorry, I'd forgotten about Joan's books. <laughs> 
Um, my suggestion is that everybody who wants to know more about the uh, uh, about the different kinds of historical fantasy that there are should simply uh, download the chat, which you can do. If you go down to the bottom of the chat, you can see those three little dots uh, to the uh, to the right of any uh, of the blank space at the bottom, and you go up to the top of the window that comes up, and it says "Save Chat." So I'm going to do that, uh, and I'm going to save it and, uh, and and have a look through these wonderful suggestions that you've put to us. But I'd like to, I, I think we're, we're, we're drawing to an end now. And uh, oh, Tim Powers, great choice, yes. Um, sorry, uh, ideas <laughs> coming to my mind. I'm having the same things like ding, ding. <laughs> yes, yes, I keep being reminded of great historical fantasy writers. Um, but I, I just really uh, like to end with a, a very warm thank you to everybody who's made this event possible. I'd like to thank my three panelists, uh, James, Liz and Fraser, for their fantastic contribution. I've really enjoyed hearing them speaking about their, uh, their work uh, and the, the various processes they've been involved in, that they've been involved in. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just been utterly entertaining all the way through. Thank you so much to Grace for being our, our tech support all the way through this. Uh, thank you to Madalena for uh, live tweeting, and she's going to be writing this up as well for the fantasy uh, for the for the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic blog. So if you want to read about what we've been saying today, uh, as mediated through an intelligent mind, then please look for that blog when it uh, when it emerges. Um, and I'd like to thank my uh, co-director Demetra for helping me with, with with all the kind of more technical issues that were going to be a re uh, be produced uh, by today's uh, today's online session. Uh, I feel like it's it's gone okay, even if we began with some strange disembodied voices which started speak speak to us. But heck, we were talking about uh, demonic fiction, so a little bit of infernality was an entirely appropriate introduction. So I'd like to thank you all for taking part. I'd especially like to thank all of you who've come and who have listened and who have made such a uh, fantastic contribution all the way through. Um, and uh, yes, I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Um, in fact, there's gonna be a, a, a great um, a conference coming up very shortly, which is about uh, religion and fantasy. Uh, and I'd urge you to turn to the, uh, uh, to, to the center's webpage to find out more about that and about other forthcoming events that are, are planned for 2021 and 2022. Thank you again. Uh, warm thanks to everybody um, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>